You guys still haven't gotten the picture. We're going to the beach. Y'all are dressed like you're going to church. Now, if you're on vacation, you should go to church before you go to the beach. Just throwing that out there. Um, but this is, we're going to the beach, and y'all aren't dressed for the occasion. Some of you are, and yes, look back there. Good job, Ben and Melanie. <laughs> Love it. But you guys are not quite ready for the beach. As you can see, we are in a uh, series called Beach Trip, where we're visiting various beaches in the Bible. And I know some of you weren't here last week, so you are exempt from dressing up today. Um, but for the rest of you, you have no excuse. Okay, anyhow, so just like whenever we have, if you have a, a pool party and you're dressed in normal clothes, or if you show up to the lake at a church event and you're wearing normal clothes, you're still going to get thrown in the water. So don't think you're exempt from getting wet today. Just throwing that out there. Anyhow, so we're heading to the beach. And any time you've ever been to the beach, you've got to recognize that the beach is not a safe place to be. Even though it's so fun and you have all these family memories of when you're a child, and I'm sorry if I'm blinding you by my white legs. It, it, I grew up in Florida and I was still as white as I am today. Polar bear. Anyhow, so um, the beach is a dangerous place. It is full of dangerous creatures. There's the riptide. Uh, there are these little things well, not little things. There are things called sharks. I don't know if you've heard of them. Uh, great white sharks. There's been movies about them. That they swim. And even if you think that you are safe, because they're huge creatures, you're safe being in knee-deep water, there are still sharks that can get you in knee-deep water. I'm just telling you that. Uh, not to scare you to death, but it is true. There are, you, you think you're safe, you're not safe. Um, and on top of that, there are jellyfish. And there are these things called Portuguese manowar, which are like jellyfish with huge tentacles. And the tentacles can break off and still sting you when they're dead. I mean, and, and they wash up on shore. And if you touch it, oh, what's that? Oh, a very dangerous place to be. And as you're out there and, and you're swimming around, you feel something brush against your leg. Whoa, what was that? Like, I'll scream like a girl. Uh, what, what in the world? It's probably just seaweed, but you're thinking it's a shark or some uh, fish that's going to bite you. The beach is not a safe place. And then if you think you're going to be okay on the shore, as you're on the beach itself, there is this oppressive ball in the sky that's so burning and hot and it wants to uh, scorch every inch of your body, which it shouldn't because you should have clothes on. But for someone like me, the sun is an enemy. And then it makes the sand so hot that if you even touch it with your bare foot, if you're an idiot like me sometimes, and you don't go with, with flip-flops, you know, I'll just walk. It is burning. Like you thought walking on asphalt in the summer was bad. You've never been to the beach when it's in the middle of summer. It is so hot. You'll get third degree burns on the bottom of your foot. The beach is not a safe play. I don't, place. I don't know why you guys, many of you, like to go to the beach. On vacation, I'd rather go to the mountains. And I realize there's snakes and bears and things and, you know, whatever. Uh, there's dangerous wherever you go. So the beach is not a safe place to be, even no matter what you think about it. And that got me to thinking about, in our journey to follow Jesus, it is not safe. We, we like to think of it as like a family vacation where everything is all hunky-dory. It's all fun and fine and dandy, but it is not safe. There are all kinds of dangers. We face all sorts of different enemies along the way. We have ourselves. There's sin. There's false teachers. There's the powers and principalities. There's a prince of darkness. There's demons. There's all sorts of enemies that we face in our walk with Christ. And in those circumstances, it can be hard to trust God, when it seems like the enemy is just so strong. And today we're going to be looking at a story in the Old Testament with uh, the people of Israel um, that long before Jesus, as God was leading them and doing various things in their nation, they had a very hard time trusting God. Over and over and over again, the theme that happens um, crops up quite a bit. And they especially had a hard time trusting God when things got dangerous. They seemed to whine all the more and trust God all the less. 
So we're going to be taking a trip with them to the beach today, and this is found in Exodus chapter 14. So go ahead and turn your Bibles to that so you can keep, follow along. Just to give you a little bit of background, Israel up until this point had been freed from the land of Egypt. God had sent plagues and convinced Pharaoh to finally let the people go. And so uh, they, they leave. They're somewhat well armed as they go, but they probably don't know how to use weapons because they've been slaves. Um, but they go out from Egypt and God begins to lead them um, through the wilderness. And God takes them on a rather strange route towards the Red Sea rather than going through the uh, Philistine territory, which would have been a much more direct route uh, to the land of promise. But God takes them in a weird direction. And I think the reason why is if they had gone straight to uh, the Philistine territory, they would have faced the Philistine army, which they were a pretty formidable force. And as soon as they would have faced the terror of the, that army, they probably would have turned tail and ran back to Egypt like a bunch of chickens. So God was leading them towards a different way. And so as they are going, they are not by themselves. God is with them. There is this pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. That is God's presence with the people. It's not just some uh, weird sign. It is God Himself leading the people. And so whenever God went, whenever the pillar went, they went. When it stopped, they stopped. It was God's visual way of reminding them that He was with them. So as they are on their journey, we begin reading in verse 14. Then the Lord said to Moses, Tell the people of Israel to turn back and encamp in front of Pi Hahiroth, between Migdal and the sea, in front of Baal Zephon, and you shall encamp facing it by the sea. For Pharaoh will say of the people of Israel, They are wandering in the land, and the wilderness has shut them in. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will pursue them, and I will get glory over Pharaoh and all, the ho all his hosts, and the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. And they did so. So God has the people of Israel change paths. Instead of going to where the Philistines were, God changes their plan, plan takes them on a different route where they are... Um, the picture is that they're going to be going towards the Red Sea and they're going to have the sea on one side, the mountains on another side, and the only other place is to the north where the Egyptians are going to be coming in. Okay, so just think about that for a second. They, and if the Egyptians come after them, they're not going to be able to quickly leave. There's the mountains, they can't go through the sea, and there's the mountains to the south, and they cannot quickly leave or even go over the mountains because there are at least two million Israelites, plus a bunch of people came with them, plus they have sheep and other animals, and they have belongings and things like that. So for them to get over the mountains with two million people is not a quick thing, especially when you have the mighty uh, army of Egypt. So the picture is God is trapping them in. Why in the world would God purposely trap His people between the sea and the mountains with no way of escape if the Israelites come? Well, Moses, or God tells Moses so that the Egyptians will see that the Israelites are vulnerable and they are going to come and attack them. That doesn't sound like a very good plan. If I was uh, Moses and the, the Israelites, I would be a little bit worried. God, what in the world are you doing? But God wants to show Pharaoh and the Egyptians that God is the real God. And up until this point, when you read the story, Pharaoh changes his mind every other second, whether he's going to let the Israelites go or not. And he, 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 he just hardens his heart. He softens his heart. Goes through this process. And he keeps vacillating. Even when God shows his power before him, Pharaoh still is wishy-washy about all of this. But after this, God hopes to show that to Pharaoh and the Egyptians who is really God. But this is an absolutely frightening proposition. God is, is setting a trap and He's using the Israelites as bait. And I don't know if you've ever read a book or if you've ever watched a movie or a TV show where somebody or where people are used as baits. 
It happens often in a crime show, maybe, where they're, they're using somebody to lure a, a drug dealer in. They're going to bust this guy, or maybe some gang people, or it happens a lot in science fiction. Oh, dude, we'll use you as a trap. We're going to catch this thing, and we'll, don't worry, we're going to get your back. We're there to barge in and help you no matter what happens. But in every single instance where this happens, it never works out. Anytime somebody says, okay, we're going to use you as bait, trust us, something bad happens. They get eaten by the alien or by the creature. They die. The drug lord gets away. It never works out in literature and TV or movies. So I can understand why Israel is a little bit apprehensive about this because it never, ever works. But they go. It's one little sentence. And they did so. They did as God said, even though they were going into a trap. They march on and they set up camp along the shores of the Red Sea. They camp out on the beach. And uh, from what I've seen, some of the pictures of the Red Sea, it is a very interesting, of course, I've never been there, just had to see pictures. But it's an interesting place because it's in this desert area, but it is... Um, very beautiful near this because there's water and there's some of the, the beaches are like kind of pebbly and they're really beautiful looking. Um, and then there are places where there's just these beautiful flowers and, and greenery and it is just a wonderful place. So you could imagine if there wasn't this terror, terror threat of the Egyptian army, this would be a really awesome place for a family vacation. They set up camp, you know, the kids are running around splashing in the water. This is a really good time. But I think from this we need to learn that we are not guaranteed safety in this world. That this was a very dangerous situation for the people of Israel to be in. And just like, like them, we are not guaranteed any bit of safety in this world. When you look at Jesus' Sermon on the Mount as He's uh, teaching the many people who have been gathered, He said, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you you, when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So Jesus says, blessed are, are you when you are persecuted because of righteousness. Blessed are you when it happens, not if it happens, when it happens. It is going to happen at some point or another uh, that, that the people of God, Jesus' followers, are going to be persecuted because they follow him. It is a dangerous proposition when we faith, uh, follow Jesus. And Jesus said that we must be willing to take up our cross daily and be willing to die for Him. Literally die, not just uh, on some, oh, I've got to put up with some person. That's my cross to bear. But in a literal sense of be, being willing to die for Jesus. That is not safe. So it is assumed that we will face opposition and persecution for following Jesus. And we should count it an honor to suffer in the name of Jesus. So when you, you continue to read in the story, Pharaoh takes the bait. He sees that Israel are, that the nation is trapped, and he gathers 600 of his best chariots. And then he says, okay, well, I'll throw in all the rest of my chariots and his horsemen. And he gathers his army, army and he begins to lead them out of town. When you read the rest of the story, it sounds like he, he led them out and then he returned back. So he sends out his army and as the Israelites are camped out by the sea, they see the chariots. They see the army approaching quickly. And in verse 10 of, of chapter 14 we read, And when Pharaoh drew near, the people of Israel lifted up their eyes and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them and they feared greatly. And the people of Israel cried out to the Lord. A very natural response because the, the army of Egypt was top-notch. It was the best army of its day. They were a mighty force, so it was a very normal and good thing to be afraid of this army. And so as, as they, they cry out in fear, they cry out to God in, in fear. And as they do this, they express a desire. We would rather go back to being slaves in Egypt than to be slaughtered here in the deserts. And that is saying something, because slavery in Egypt was absolutely brutal. Uh, recently, I read an article about an excavation that they're doing in Egypt um, where they found this, this 
not necessarily a mass grave, but they would uh, bury several people, maybe different family members, um, in these, these graves together. And the grave area was for people 7 to 25. Young, very young people. Most of them were under 15. Uh, and there were different breakdowns as, as to what discoveries they found in different age groups. But they found that there was a lot of arthritis in even young kids. Uh, a lot of them had cracked vertebrae. Um, even the young kids, 15 and under. Uh, most of them had signs of heavy work. Like when you, when you look at the, the bones and you can see the, the, the joints and you can see all the different the stress fractures and all that to indicate that these people were under a heavy load. Seven-year-olds to 25-year-olds with arthritis, with cracked vertebrae. They were horribly abused. And, and maybe there weren't any people older than 25 because they didn't survive that long under this oppression. And yet they were wanting to go back to that where they're burying their seven-year-olds who were dying because of oppressive slave labor. I mean, this is what they're wanting to go back to. And so they're crying out to God. They are afraid of the Egyptian army. But then Moses gives them a pep talk and he says, don't be afraid. God is going to fight for you. Don't you see this pillar of cloud here? God is with us. He is going to fight for us. Don't worry about what the Egyptians are, are what they're, they're um, threatening you with. Trust God. Remember, God has done all of these things in Egypt. He sent the plagues. He, he slaughtered the firstborn. God is going to fight for us. Don't worry. And so, as, as, as we look at this, we've got to recognize that we have a great reason to be bold in the face of fear. That we are not fighting this battle by ourselves. God is with us. As uh, John, in his uh, first letter that he wrote, uh, he, he, we, we read this recently, where he's warning against false teachers. He says, Little children, you are from God and have overcome them, for he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. As John is talking about these false prophets, as they are speaking really from lies of Satan, he says that we who are Christians have the Holy Spirit within us. And he is much more mighty than, than Satan, the prince of this earth, who is going around doing whatever he does, that Jesus, the Holy Spirit within us, is even greater so that even though the Israelites had the pillar of fire and the pillar of cloud, that they could see God, we don't necessarily see God, but He is with us. And because He is with us, we do not have to be afraid of the things that we face. But even though we do face them and we will be afraid, we can have confidence because God is with us. And he will fight for us. He, he is fighting for us even now. There is a spiritual war and he is there engaging that battle on our behalf. So as the Israelites are crying out, Moses is giving a pep talk. Pep talk, God speaks in and gives some words. He says, the Lord said to Moses, when you, why are you crying to me? Talk, talk to Moses. Why are you whining? Tell the people of Israel to go forward. Lift up your staff and stretch your hand over the sea and divide it, that the people of Israel may go through the sea on dry ground. And I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they shall go in after them, and I will get glory over Pharaoh and all of his hosts, his chariots and his horsemen. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I have gotten glory over Pharaoh, his chariots and his horsemen. So in verse 15, apparently Moses himself was throwing a pity party because God says, why are you crying out? Why are you whining, Moses? We don't hear exactly what he was whining about, but he was whining too, undoubtedly about the, Is the Israelites and their stubbornness and their, their, their bunch of babies. God, why are you making me lead these babies? Just uh, drives me crazy. Um, and so he tells, that, tells Moses to stop your crying and start moving. Do, do what I'm telling you to do. And then God is revealing his plan a little bit more. That Moses is to lay or raise this, his staff, the staff of Aaron that he threw down and become a snake, to eat the, the snakes of Pharaoh's snakes. Um, so the, the same staff, he's to raise it up, and God is going to split the sea. And then the Israelites are going to walk across the newly formed land um, as if it were dry ground. So they're on the, 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 the beach. 
And all of a sudden, in front of them is going to open up a new beach, instant beach. We've come to another beach. We, we went to the beach of the Red Sea, and now there's a beach through the Red Sea. Very interesting set of circumstances. And so um, God is going to, again, use this opportunity to show how awesome he is to show the Egyptian army who is boss. And it's not Pharaoh. And then as, they, as they're working all the details of what is about to happen, the pillar of fire moves behind them and gets between the Egyptian army and the Israelites so that the army doesn't attack. I think there's a really good lesson in here too, that we need to shut down the pity party and do what God calls us to do. It is so easy to whine about our circumstances, to complain about what we're going through. We focus on our weaknesses. We focus on our barriers. We focus on the closed doors. We focus on, on all manner of things. We focus on our comfort. Imagine how uncomfortable it was for them to just pick up one night and leave, and they, have none of the, they don't have their beds. They don't have their couches. They don't have their TVs. They just get up, and they leave. And I understand they didn't have that stuff back then. I'm just... They had to leave everything, they, their whole life, and get up and follow God in this hot, dry desert. No comfort at all. And sometimes we are so focused on our comfort that we don't see or we don't do what God has called us to do. We whine and we complain and we moan and groan rather than just getting up and doing what God wants us to do. So Moses obeys God and he raises up his staff. And as they are standing on the one beach, another one opens up before them. God has done this through sending in an east wind. Uh, east winds are kind of common in this area, but it's not an, it's enough maybe to, to cause a little bit of wave, but it's not enough to divide it. God had done something even special to drove a completely different kind of wind to go in and draw, uh, drive out the, the water. So it's piled up on both sides. And it's not like low tide. Some people say, well, it was just low tide in the sea when we went back and they were able to cross. And that wasn't what happened either because it divided up on both sides. And there was a beach between the two different sides. So it wasn't some unusual weather, pat weather pattern or low tide. God had done some miraculous thing to cause this to happen. And then Israel begins to trek through this new beach on dry ground. Probably not completely dry, but dry enough for them to walk on as they are going from one to the other. And they didn't go single file like you might see in The Prince of Egypt or other, or not, right? yeah, uh, or other movies. You know, they're, they're huddling through it's this little narrow corridor. It's wide. There are two million people that are having to get through in a matter of hours, plus their animals, their kids. Imagine your kids are running around different places and you're trying to keep track of them. Don't go over in the water. I mean, there, there's a lot of things going on. And it was a slow-moving effort and a very wide group of people to get through this uh, night. And by the way, this happened at night. And they had plenty of light from the pillar of fire, but it was still at night as they are going through this sea. And then God works to fulfill his promise to fight for them. He says, I'm going to fight for you. Moses said, God's going to fight for you. The trap is about to be sprung. When you look at verse 23, we read that the Egyptians pursued and went in after them in the midst of the sea. All of Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. And in the morning watch, the Lord in the pillar of the fire and of the cloud looked down on the Egyptian forces and threw the Egyptian forces into a panic, clogging their chariot wheels so that they drove heavily. And the Egyptians said, Let us flee from before Israel, for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. So God confuses the, arm, the Egyptian army as they've gone into the sea. And we read that their, uh, wheel, their chariot wheels are getting clogged. There's some mud and there's probably some plant matter and some animal parts because that happens. You know, fish die and they float to the bottom. You know, there's probably some crabs that are getting stuck in there too. Their, their chariot wheels are getting clogged and they cannot proceed. So they try to turn tail and run because they recognize that God is fighting for the Israelites. But then... Moses stretches out his hands again, and the walls crash in. And the Egyptian army that had been in the middle of the sea, all of them had drowned. 
every single one of them. And we read in the text that even bodies were floating uh, on the shore. Absolutely decimated the Egyptian army, which is the, the number one fighting force of, on earth of that day. So Egypt, Egypt's army was decimated, but Israel was saved. For us who are Christians, we will be saved because Jesus has conquered our biggest enemies of sin and death. He, he fought for us. He fought the battle against sin for us by being hung on the cross for dying for us. He fought the battle and he won. Even as he was laid in the grave and they thought that they had, the Romans had thought that they had conquered Jesus, Jesus opened up the tomb and he came out alive again. He conquered all of our enemies of sin and death. And when you read the book of Revelation, all the rest of our enemies, whether they be false teachers, whether they be false religions, whether they be forces of evil, God is going to overthrow every single one of them and finally even Satan himself will be completely decimated and thrown into the lake of fire. So all the enemies that we face, they are, they are already defeated, church. We are already victorious because of what Jesus has done for us. So instead of walking around like, oh, I'm, look at the world, they're so sinful, we feel so alone. Oh, I just, I just hate living in this world. It's so hard, I get sick. I, instead of being defeated and having a, a negative pessimistic attitude, we need to have our heads held high, acknowledging and recognizing that we have victory through Jesus and we have His presence in us to continually give us victory through whatever it is that we face. And we remember, we re read not many weeks ago in 1 Corinthians 15, where Paul says the sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So we already have victory, and we ought to be confident because of that. So if you remember, back in, in the beginning of this, God told the, the Israelites that he was going to let everybody know that he is God, that he is awesome, and that the Egyptian army is nothing. He was going to make his glory known before the Egyptians. When we read in verse 30, Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the, Egypt, or when, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Israel saw the great power that the Lord used against the Egyptians, so that the people feared the Lord, and they believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. So it wasn't just for Egypt. It wasn't just for Pharaoh. It wasn't just for the Egyptian army to show that God is God, but it was to show Israel that God is God. Not the gods of Egypt, not Pharaoh, but God himself is the Lord who is most powerful. They had witnessed God's power over and over again, and they had seen it yet again in this instance. And so they fear the Lord, that they trust God. But we know from history, we know Israel's story, that they are quick to forget what God has done. When you look over at the next chapter in the story, in, verse, in chapter 15, verse 24, uh, that they have an issue with water. And the people grumbled against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? They doubt God again. God had shown himself so many times. He had provided for them miraculously, supernaturally, so many different ways. And they're wondering, where are we going to get water? Are we going to die? And as you read the stories, they're wandering through the desert. They whine and they complain and they moan and groan over and over again. They doubt God over and over and over again. They completely forget what God had done to them the, the, the day before, the week before, the month before, the years before. They forget what God has done. They, they complain. They rebel. They try to make a God of their own hands. They continually forget God. So don't forget it's so easy to forget what God has done. It's so easy to forget His promises. It's so easy to forget the price that He paid. But don't be like the Israelites. Remember what He has done. But in this story, we see God beginning to fulfill a promise that He had made long ago to Abraham. When God said, I'm going to make 
from you, Abraham and your wife, a nation is so innumerable that you won't even be able to count them. It's like counting the stars or counting the sands of the seashore. It's going to be this mighty nation. And I'm going to give them this land of promise, this promised land. And in this story, we see that God is fulfilling that promise. He's leading them out of slavery in Egypt, and he's leading them to a new promised land, the land of Canaan, that was rich, and, and it was fertile, and there were animals, and there were houses, and there were all sorts of things that they were going to inherit. But we're not marching to Israel. God isn't leading us to take over Israel from the Palestine, Palestinians. But God is leading us to a promised land of our own. It's not found in any nation. It's not found on any continent of this earth. And despite what people have said in the past, even though we do live in a good country, America is not God's promised land. The promised land is not in China. The promised land is not in Israel. The promised land is not in the Caribbean islands or in the Outer Banks. West Virginia, even though it is almost heaven, it is not the promised land. Our promised land is in the presence of God. That is the promised land that we are heading to as we journey through this life. And when you read the description of this awesome promised land, it is depicted as if there is a river of life flow, flowing from the throne of Christ. Well, we don't have to worry about, oh, I'm not, where am I going to get my water? It is there always flowing from Christ Himself. And we see that there is a tree that is planted along this river that really it's rooted on both sides. It is like an archway that goes over the river and it produces 12 kinds of fruit. And every month it produces fruit. There is no end to the fruit of the tree of life. Even more plentiful than when Egypt or when Israel sends out spies to check out the land of Canaan, they, they pull, bring back these grape clusters that are so huge it takes many men to carry them. The land that we are going to is even more fruitful than that. But in this land, there is also no war. There is no destruction. There are no enemies. All the divisions that we have amongst people are done away with. They are healed by what Christ has done. All sin, all unholy, th every unholy thing is gone. There is no sin, there is no temptation, there is no Satan anymore. And in the midst of this great promised land, we see that God has His throne, and there with Him is the Lamb who was slain for our sins. God's glory is so bright, it shines so greatly that there is no need for a sun or a moon or stars anymore because God, His glory, gives us the light that we need. And what is so awesome about that is usually when you read the Bible, when people see God's glory, they hide, they run, they say, put a veil on. They, they try to get away from God's glory because it's so bright and shining. But in that new promised land that God is leading us, we won't be afraid. We won't cower in fear. Yea, we may fall on our faces in worship. We will not be running and hiding from the glory of God. But we're not there yet. Like the Israelites who wandered in the desert, we are still wandering on this earth. We will face many enemies, but just like God fought for the Israelites, God fights for us. He is the mighty, the commander of the mighty army of heaven. What he says, he sends the angels and the angels obey. This is the same God who created the, the universe with a word. And he fights on our behalf. And Jesus himself came to this earth to battle against sin and death. And after he conquered, he has sent the Spirit into our lives to empower us in our battles that we face in this world. And he who is in us is greater than he who is in the world. He's greater than Satan. He's greater than problems. He's greater than anyone that we might face who is our enemy. So we're not there yet. But keep trusting. And don't forget 
what God has done.